Well, it maybe maybe in a sense because I did have I did have Maslow's hierarchy up, and remember, it's a it's a starting point. It's something to consider. There are obviously more complex models in sociology, let alone our own personal psychological uh, needs or uh, ways to live our lives. But we're using that as a, a home base from which we're, we can operate. And for tonight, in fact, um, <laughs> well, hey, Azzy, if you if you have some time, even while you're making characters, you are very much welcome to participate in our workshop. I, I look forward to it. Uh, how we usually do this is we'll spend the first part discussing a uh, a real world concept like culture, uh, intelligent life, or sort of prehistorical life. Uh, we talked about the you know various uh, ways to create celestial bodies, etc. So we'll have a real talk, though I, I'm not turning my chair around and, and my cat backwards. You say, well. You know who else created a universe, right? Uh, as we take a a brief look to understand concepts that we can touch on or know, it is not an in depth study. I am not uh, I am not uh, providing an accredited course, uh, though. If you role play long enough, uh, you can you can get a. Uh, a broad knowledge of a lot of different things, a very interdisciplinary uh, background for all the things that you research and you look up. Uh, but as he, as any of these topics might intersect a character, uh, that character, or another character you've made, or just even worldly concepts that you've approached, uh, we begin by talking about uh, this, this yucky real-life stuff that surrounds us uh, every day. And in the in the second part of the workshop, that's when we we work together in the realm of fantasy that we've made together, and we can draw upon concepts that were discussed before, but might exist in some unique fashion in our you know in our separated world of uh, of not reality. You have an idea, so humanity for really ever since the dawn of civilization has made good use of intermediate sleeping like taking watch the people of dnd and know that all of their physical wounds heal in just a good night's rest why don't they abuse it well hit points hit points are not just physical injury that's usually the most dramatic way to to present hit points but hit points are a lot more abstract than just wounds, which is also why uh, a knight's rest can often heal some hit points. It might help a, a scab over a cut. While the cut's not healed, you're also not actively being infected nor bleeding out. It's also a way for you to reset your brain juices up here by getting some semblance of sleep so that your experience, uh, any any other lingering effects, or just you might feel refreshed. Because hit points, in a sense, are also just a fatigue of the mind or the spirit to perpetuate on. Now, in some settings, hit points may very well be physical uh, wounds. Well, and and also there are there are alternate rules even in official books where uh, that's not the case. You may not heal at all over a long rest, or you only heal half. Um, but in a world as you're proposing, why why wouldn't sleeping just be a regenerative effect? And you're right. In that world, it would be something that everyone would take advantage of, uh, though. Uh, there's different approaches you could take if your average commoner is, you know, a level zero peasant or the like, might have one hit point. Um, if if you lose that hit point, then you're gone anyway, so there's nothing to abuse, because there's really no long treks. Uh, you don't have a, a hit point pool of 100, 
such that if you lose 70, you get back that 70 with uh, just by sleeping it off. As someone with 100 hit points would be a demigod uh, to the average villager uh, living a rural lifestyle in the countryside. Uh, magic can be incredibly rare. Uh, there are D&D games where magic doesn't exist or where magic is everything. Or a setting like Eberron where magic is very broad. E almost everyone has uh, access to magic in some way. As a public utility or just as uh, a wand for personal defense. Um, but magic doesn't tend to get deep. I believe the King of Corvair... The big main continent, right, of Eberron, a veteran of the Hundred Year War and king of this country, I think the king is a level five fighter. Yeah, or Dark Sun, where magic's killing the planet. <laughs> Uh, now, what I want to do for this is I'm, a, I'm actually going to open up. I'm going to open up with a video this time. I know, weird, right? I usually save those for the end of the discussion. But this is going to be a very good way to prime everything else, like the Silk Road here, that we can discuss. Azzy, if you'd like to share, go ahead. I'll I, I'll make sure to, to refer up while we're having uh, the economic discussion. This is the world we live in. If we weren't surrounded by it every day, if we didn't take it for granted, we'd be dumbstruck by its very intricacy and brilliance. This is an ordinary, familiar wooden pencil. You might think a pencil is simple. Chances are you've been using one since before you could even read or write. But just because it's familiar doesn't mean it's simple. In fact, it's complicated, elaborate, beautiful, elegant. Its very existence is too improbable for any one person to truly comprehend. These are the basic materials that go into a pencil, graphite, cedar, metal, and rubber. But if you had all the elements of a pencil right in front of you, could you make a pencil? It's not as easy as you might think. In fact, no single person on the face of the earth could do it without the help of countless others. And this is the key to understanding the world. A pencil, just like you and me, is the end result of a vast and intricate family tree, a symphony of human activity that spans the globe. Through their work and knowledge, a vast number of people have had a hand in making this simple pencil. Unlike your family tree, this one begins with an actual tree. The most immediate ancestor of the pencil is a cedar tree in the Pacific Northwest. But the loggers who harvest the timber are also its ancestors. And these men don't work alone. They, in turn, are assisted by the people and industries that produce the saws, rope, and countless other tools that they use. These are also the ancestors of our pencil. As is the waitress at a nearby diner who sells the loggers lunch, to say nothing of the thousands of people involved in producing that simple midday meal. Across time and space, the web grows. Consider the roads, trucks, ships, communication systems, and the people who design, build, and maintain them. All of them are necessary to bring the lumber to the mills and the slat factories that process them. All of them are also the ancestors of the pencil. And even with the work of all these people, so far all we have 
is a stained wooden slat, a naked half of a wooden body of a pencil. But its family tree is larger and more extensive. The graphite is mined in China and Sri Lanka. At the pencil factory, it's mixed with clay and heat and other materials before it's extruded, dried, and baked in a kiln. People from different continents, different cultures, cooperate to bring these materials together with waxes and kilns and equipment from across the world. These, too, are the ancestors of the pencil. And the same is true of the eraser. With ingredients from around the world, it's the end result of a similarly complex and exotic branch of the family tree. As is the ferrule, the metal band made from material that is mined, refined, and shipped from all over the world. Each part of the pencil is the result of the collaboration and cooperation of millions of people. Together, they form a process that is constantly changing and adapting. A change in the availability or cost of material from one place might make another source more desirable, and the process changes and adapts fluidly. And there is a fact that's still more astounding. The absence of a mastermind, of anyone dictating these countless actions which bring a pencil into being. Each member of this family tree supplies only a small amount of the necessary know-how needed to make a pencil. They do so voluntarily, not because they necessarily want pencils or like pencils, but because by working to create them, they exchange their labor and skills for the wages to let them buy what they want and need. What you're seeing is the market at work. The spontaneous configuration of creative human energies, of millions of people with their various skills and talents, organizing voluntarily in response to human necessity and desire, as if led by an invisible hand to promote an end which was no part of the intention. Every second we are alive, we benefit from the products of voluntary, spontaneous cooperation. This is the modern world. It's miraculous, it's intricate, and it gets better every day, so long as people are free to interact with each other. If we can leave the creative energies of humankind uninhibited, there's no limit to what we can accomplish. That's the primer, right? Th that I I led I led with the grand finale. I hope that you enjoyed watching this and that this got across. Well, there's a lot of ideas like the invisible hand, and th that's not. I mean, there's a magic spell in D and D that is uh, <laughs> pretty much an invisible hand. Though, in an economic sense, that means something a little bit different. Let's get this, uh, I'll share this over with you all. And let's return back to... In the background, I, I've had a track playing from Tabletop Audio called a Wuja Tea House. And I suppose we can use that in this sense, uh, because not only is it very calming and peaceful, it can help back up what I want to convey when I discuss economics. And why would, why would that topic be of any importance to someone in role-playing? Let's look at a real example in our history. All right. In this case, this is an article discussing what was known as the Silk Road. The Silk Road is neither an actual road nor a single route. The term instead refers to a network of routes used by traders for more than 1500 years from when the Han Dynasty of China opened trade <clears throat> pardon, 
130 BCE until 1453 CE, when the Ottoman Empire closed off trade with the West. German geographer and traveler Ferdinand von uh, Richthofen first used the term Silk Road in 1877 to describe the well-traveled pathway of goods between Europe and, A and East Asia. The term also serves as a metaphor for the exchange of goods and ideas between diverse cultures. Although the trade network is commonly referred to as the Silk Road, some historians favor the term Silk Routes because it better reflects the many paths taken by traders. Well, I mean, Azzy, if, if what I'm offering isn't interesting, uh, I appreciate you still being here. Um, you know, I, I'm not going to compel you to stay, and I, I want to make this an actual discussion uh, and something that is relevant to the hobby, as primarily that's that's what I do. I like teaching and taking these concepts and finding ways that, through a form of entertainment, we can enhance our stories, enhance our characters, make worlds that are more dynamic, but also not as stressful to run because we're operating on a uh, on a, a a basic level of knowledge. Oh, I, all right, Azzy, no problem. So I'm not going to read through the entire article. I linked it for you. It's on National Geographic. And uh, it you're going to, uh, whether or not this is something you've recognized or maybe even the modern incarnation as there there is an online uh part of the silk road though that is uh often more of a uh, a dark web style uh reference or place about uh moving goods or services uh, that are perhaps gray at its brightest um but here's a name if uh if any of you have ever spent uh time in a swimming pool public or private one of the most famous travelers of the Silk Road was Marco Polo. Born into a family of wealthy merchants in Venice, Italy, Marco traveled with his father to China, then Cathay. When he was just 17 years of age, they traveled for over three years before arriving at Kublai Khan's palace at Xanadu in 1275. Marco stayed on at Khan's court and was sent on missions to parts of Asia never before visited by Europeans. Upon his return, Marco Polo wrote about his adventures, making him and the routes he traveled famous. Yeah, I, I like joking about that when I show the videos, you know. Ee, 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 ee. Now we'll we'll wheel out the TV and I'll I'll throw on Beekman's world for y'all, and, th and there we go. It's hard to overstate the importance of the Silk Road on history. Religion and ideas spread along the Silk Road just as fluidly as goods. Towns along the route grew into multicultural cities. The exchange of information gave rise to new technologies and innovations that would change the world. The horses introduced to China contributed to the might of the Mongol Empire, while gunpowder from China changed the very nature of war in Europe and beyond. Diseases also traveled along the Silk Road. Some research suggests that the Black Death, which devastated Europe in the late 1340s, likely spread from Asia along the Silk Road. The age of exploration gave rise to faster routes between the East and West, but the parts of the Silk Road continued to be critical pathways among varied cultures. Today, parts of the Silk Road are listed on UNESCO's World Heritage List. And... There's obviously uh, other uh, other articles, and we're, I, we started with the map for it. But Age of Exploration, we have the East India Trading Company, uh, which even in pop culture through Pirates of the Caribbean and other places, um, has uh, has facilitated a lot of trade, and not just of goods, not just of money, but of ideas. How is it that Indonesia became? a uh, an Islamic nation. Well, 
if we take a look when people empowered by technology and purpose, a desire to serve others, whether that is a king, a god, or just uh, their peerage, or even challenge themselves, we can see here that you you didn't need a uh, a jet, you didn't need uh, diesel ships. In fact, sailing ships, uh, sailing ships, of course, helped. But a lot of this was all along land routes through different countries controlled by different people of different faiths. And what would bring, what would bring Islam from the Middle East to Southeast Asia? What would bring Buddhism out of India through uh, through the Far East? And the spices, the spice must flow, right, everyone? The spices, the, the different woods, even architecture, uh, medicines and diseases, um, you know, things that would have varied uses, like gunpowder, would also come from societies where it was developed for its own reasons, accidentally or purposefully, and used similarly or differently by others. And trade was also a way to find peace, as it's much more desirable to trade goods and services than to trade arrows or bullets with another country. Because even if there are some cultural differences, the end result may still be desired more than the differences between the individuals who produced or transported the goods uh, can overcome. And you know, for many individuals, there's lines in the sand. Um, you might say, I will, you know, I will only, uh, if I can help it, I will only buy or consume products that were made in the U.S., uh, or you might say, uh, for for a dietary need, uh, if you uh, if you cannot uh, process something, uh, you, you can't process dairy. I I will not engage in the trade of dairy. Right? Uh, you you have no need to consume it. Or if it's another allergen, uh, why work on a peanut farm if you are allergic to peanuts or shellfish? You know. As much fun as fishing is, so th there could be uh, there could be those needs. There could be religious observations uh, that that come into play. There either something that is enhanced uh, through a requirement or something that is forbidden through taboo. You know, we come into dietary restrictions, or in Islam, uh, where you are you are forbidden from drinking alcohol, right? These are behaviors that are modified through, with, or by trading. Or you may very well trade with someone who drinks alcohol while you do not for your own reasons. Personal, religious, medical, whatever else. But the thing that you trade, the good or the service, is valuable enough that it's okay the other person doesn't celebrate, accept, or understand this part of you, nor you them, but you each have gotten something you wanted out of that exchange. And by doing so, by understanding, well, my neighbor in a country over, we disagree on a lot of things, but I'll, I'll tell you what, the fact that they consistently bring over a flower that we use to make a beautiful dye and that dye is important to us for whatever reason, that is preventing skirmishes or war. Not that economics can't incite those things too, just as with everything else we've looked at. 
you know, for all the good religion does, it can also be the cause of tragedies, individual or broader. Technology is the same. We opened up with uh, It's Evolution Baby from Pearl Jam, which showed a demonstration of uh, the evolution of technology alongside us and uh, very arguable results or mixed results through that music video. Hi, Bane, by the way. Good to see you. Uh, I'm sorry, I missed uh, I missed some stuff here. Goblin of Gygaxnor says stories of griffins. Uh, yeah, folk tales and other uh, and other things. Uh, the Kirin of uh, of Chinese and going on to other uh, like uh, Japan and other countries. Uh, the Kirin is an awful lot like a giraffe, and giraffes, at least in our modern times, uh, are not an Asiatic species. And so stories and images and other and other things can travel both ways along these routes or roads. Uh, game theory mutually beneficial, says James. Uh, Bane says, I would like to start a bandit group of oppressed refugees that were beaten down by the oppressive Chinese government provinces to let our families survive. Celtic says, I wonder if there is a substance that acts like alcohol on the species we're making. There may very well be, whether it is alcohol or something else. It was um, the TV show, uh, it wasn't Twin Peaks, it was uh, Alien Nation, I believe, where the aliens uh, in that show got drunk off of spoiled milk. Bane says, why do you have to bring up the three beers I've consumed tonight? I feel like I'm being singled out. James says, there's a number of factors there, geographical location, your resources, large and cheap labor force, infrastructure, etc. Uh, what if giraffes were really just a story about a group of animals that just had long necks and weren't that long, but got over-exaggerated due to reference? Uh, a tall tale, if you would, Bane, a tall tale. It was alienation? Ah, uh, hey, all right, all right, DQ. Um, so with, with this map, um, and you're like, oh, ideas for use in the classroom. I, do I have to be in a classroom? Just read it. Enjoy it. This is excellent. You can also, uh, like explore this. And if this takes you on various, uh, click adventures to go down that rabbit hole, please. And you can see that interconnectedness that all of the graphics here really, really, really super duper uh, tried to get across. Because when it comes here again, you don't, you may not know the person who made your sword. That person might have very dubious, uh, in fact, might even be an enemy of yours and, and would kill you on sight. Though you have that sword and you're not questioning it, it's a material in your hand and you're using it for your purposes. You still have it one way or the other. And it was through that exchange because someone had to mine the ore, someone had to bring it to the smith. Uh, the smith had to have other, uh, other, uh, you know, coal or other things for the furnace. Bellows, if we're at that level of understanding and technology, the clay uh, to make it and then eventually sell it and trade it either directly to that person or uh, or through other people and it eventually ended up in that person's hands, in that soldier's hands. Uh, maybe even such that because of the rivalry, the smith might be put to his own sword. There's a very common expression uh, for, uh, you know, an argument against capitalism, right? Uh, that a, a capitalist will sell you, um, you know, will sell you your own rope kind of a thing. Uh, and that's that's how this is, right? As humanity interacts, because we would much rather we would much rather be as safe as possible and come up with ways to make a living off of our creativity, or to feel um, hi, coffee cat, uh, or to feel empowered by actually being able to exercise some kind of a morality more than just scavenging for food and water. 
or for that little bit of, of good brain juice for problem solving, uh, or actually being able to sit back and not just act on an availability heuristic of, uh, of just judging based on your first instinct to actually have judges or an impartial view of something, right? The mark of an educated mind is to entertain an idea without necessarily needing to accept it. Boy, to be a philosopher in that day and age. Because you could actually afford to do that sort of stuff. And this is why we see technology spread and grow and adapt to the changing pressures and desires we see religion spread and even adapt and be adopted over time. And we went into cults and sects, S-E-C-T-S, sects. Uh, we went into denominations and how these things have also spread and grown over time as people's ideas did the same thing along the same routes. Why is it now that we have, you know, we have a, a central core of Catholicism, though there's different flavors of it. You could argue that, uh, that, you know, Episcopal is Catholic light, or you could say that it's a Protestant religion. And from there, you can get to greater degrees of, of Protestant, of removal from even the Anglican Church. And yet, each of these institutions, be it Eastern Orthodox, be it, uh, you know, be it Methodist, be it uh, Jehovah's Witness, have these uh, people who attend who are seeking spiritual guidance and fulfillment and want to uh, live as good and moral a life as they could be in this group together. And while there's differences and rivalries and uh, warfare between the factions, it is still something that it serves a very similar purpose. And this is why economics in a fantasy world, it may not need to always be understood, but it is a force of nature like anything else, as it relies on it. Just as we see round planets and round moons and rings orbiting, just like the atoms that build this all, we uh, the smallest parts of us can often be reflected in a greater lens. And of course, we see microeconomics and macroeconomics too. But if humans are causing a behavior then the economics are going to have a, uh, a reflection of that behavior. Now, we hope th th there's a baked-in presumption that uh, there are rational market forces, that people will do what is best for them, that they will make these rational decisions. And, uh, and lately, uh, a trend against that through concepts like FOMO, fear of missing out, or YOLO, FOMO and YOLO, have been very heavily leaned into, uh, especially by companies that wish to market, uh, to play into a more irrational, possibly even uh, illogical result. And, of course, uh, now in pop culture, we have the blow up of loot boxes and why that was, you know, it started out, it grew up to be very strong and all these games have uh, microtransactions and season passes and, uh, you know, oh, this is the, the limited time skin. Collect it now. And I'll tell you, if it seems like, uh, Matt, oh, you're being a hypocrite. You sell magic cards or you sell uh, blind uh, blind packs of pre-painted minis. In a sense, yeah. I, I have to hope that you all have enough of a curiosity that you wish to engage in a behavior that you at least perceive that you have faith that you believe is beneficial to you. Now, whether or not you get the card or the miniature you like, well, that's another matter. Uh, but that's also why many of these stores also allow for trading. You know, go to go to a store like the Exchange, a buy sell trade store. Go to your friendly local game store. You will see economics happening around you all the time. Whether it is hardline, money to money, or it's something like, tell you what, you're my friend, give me 10 bucks and buy me a soda from the cooler, we'll call it even. Are you sure? That's a $20 card, look. I get it. It, you know, things are, uh, things are rough for you right now, like you were just talking about it, right? You just lost your job. I know you're selling because you need money. 
I could get $20 for it, but if you give me 10 bucks and buy me a soda, I promise, dude, we're cool. And here we have equally entertained the same exchange. We have the same handshake for 20 bucks, as that is a, a broadly agreed upon market price. Although, uh, although, and now we have a, a individually agreed upon market price of $10 in a soda at that. Which can bring us into... By the way, Investopedia is a very, very good resource for you all. The history of money. I don't have any boxes right now. I'm at, I'm at home base, Bane. Now, Investopedia is nice because while they present topics, it's written in a very friendly manner and often are accompanied by small videos. So here we go. Oh, that's right, everyone. It is, uh, it's video time once more. And uh, let's see if I can... Bartering is the direct trade of goods and services that predated the monetary system. Back in the day, someone might offer a stone axe in exchange for help with killing a mammoth. Such arrangements took time to finalize. China used small replicas of tools and weapons as an exchange medium around 1100 BC. The replica's shapes were simplified to circles because no one wanted to put a sharp tool in their pocket. These were the first coins. King Alades of Lydia minted the first official currency in 600 BC from a mix of silver and gold. Lydia's currency improved its trade, elevating it among the richest empires in Asia Minor. Meanwhile in China, paper currency replaced coins, and the emperor had a good handle on money and denominations by 1200 AD, when they were visited by Marco Polo. European banks started using paper notes which operated much like today's currency around 1600 AD. The first paper currency issued by a European government went to colonial governments in North America. Shipments between Europe and the colonies took a long time, so the colonials used IOUs that traded as currency. Shifting to paper money increased international trade. Banks and ruling classes started buying foreign currencies, creating the first currency market, which eventually led to currency wars. Now, there's a lot you can extrapolate from that, and that is only... Uh, hi, Small. Good to see you. Uh, welcome. And that is only... Right? It's, it's the beginning. It is one minute and 30 seconds of some ideas to begin an exploration, right? where you can you can go in a lot of different directions and and that opened up a, a lot but we did begin with we we did begin with uh uh bartering and in fact uh uh small uh if you're here do you have a minute can i can i ask you a question i'm putting you on the spot but don't worry it's it's not going to be a bad spot all right, Small, you are an artist, correct? Okay. Small, you take commissions, right? You you trade your time and labor uh, for things, correct? If I gave you a pine cone, would you give me a drawing? <laughs> be, be careful, it's legally binding. It, it's a pine cone. It 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 is uh uh here I'll I'll show you. Small, I'll tell you what. I, I'm not going on break. Uh I am I'm using this merely as example, okay? Here you go. Small, 
I know that you will will draw something for me. I go out to a pine tree uh, and I pluck a pine cone and I walk up to you and I, I place it in your hand and I say one art, please. Now we'll say it, it's a night it's a brown pine cone. It's in full bloom. Uh, it's not damaged or missing anything. I didn't I didn't steal the pine nuts out of it. Uh, it is it's the pine cone. Would you take one pine cone for a drawing? Although I I love the healthy amount of suspicion that it has been brought up in chat. <laughs> Pro all right see probably not now small and by the way th this isn't leading into any kind of a trap th it, this is probably going to be an obvious answer for many of us now i just spent i just spent a part of my afternoon walking to the pine tree maybe even reaching up super high and plucking the best pine cone and bringing it back to you. Well, I spent my my time in labor. Why why would you not accept a pine cone in exchange for uh, a two-hour commission? If it took me uh, two hours to go get my, my pine cone, well, surely I could use two of your hours in exchange, right? Why Why wouldn't... This is a, a very fair, right? Two hours for two hours. Why wouldn't you take my pine cone? Uh, Demon Quiller, I don't have enough tier three subs for that kind of a video. Yeah, I, th that's small. That's a very good answer. There's a lot of different answers. You could just say, I don't like them or I'm allergic to them. They will literally kill me if, if this touches my skin. You could just say, I have no use for a pine cone. It doesn't, it may not feed me. It may not help my art. It may not provide me uh, fuel for heat or anything. I, I, do, I just don't need a pine cone. And you know what? There, even though it was a reasonable offer, in fact, small, I would argue that my two hours of labor was more intense than yours of of sitting down at the at a drawing table. And, uh, you know, because I had to shimmy up a tree. I had to look for the best pine cone. I got stung by a bee. Uh, I had a bird poop on me. But none of that really matters because when it comes down to it, I, I have a pine I have one one fine specimen of a pine cone and it's just not what you need and hey that that happens right and I I might be very disappointed I might it, I might be irate I might go how dare you small this means war and all of a sudden our tribes are at war and it's an irreconcilable difference oh that sucks now small you might go well you know pine nuts are tasty. Or and or I could use them for fuel to uh, to heat uh, to you know to heat my house. So I'll, I'll tell you what, Matt. If you give me one hundred pine cones, I will draw something for you for two hours. And I go, really? Well, I really want that drawing. And you've expressed an interest in the pine cones that I have. I don't have the skill to draw. You do. That's your resource with your time. I have a resource of pine cones. And I, I say, well, you know, all he said was a hundred. Maybe, uh, maybe they don't all have to be the best because, you know, he's just going to, he's going to extract the pine nuts out of it and burn the cones. You know what? Small, you got yourself a deal. I, you know, uh, I will come back with a hundred pine cones 
I'll give them to you, and then you're on, buddy. And there we go. Now we've bartered. We've traded. Uh, we've traded taking a charred stick, uh, drawing on, uh, you know, the the on some vellum, on some leather, for me going unga bunga and shimming up a, a couple pine trees over on my side of the whatever on my side of the mountain and i collect 100 pine cones and take them back and sure enough you know what happens small now has a, a little source of food and fuel i have a charcoal drawing on the back of uh vellum small goes back to his cave he eats the pine nuts and he burns the remains for warmth. I go back to my side of the mountain and I have something that I could never produce and probably other people in my tribe could never produce. Now, Small is getting a very practical use from the pine cones. Mine may not... I mean, I could I burn it? Yeah, you know. <laughs> Will it burn? Uh, it could, but I would prefer not to. But instead, I might bring back uh, an object of worship because all of a sudden I have something no one else does uh, and a skill that no one else does. And so I hold it up on high and my tribe goes, oh, it's beautiful. Like, is this what our god or goddess or something looks like? And we each obtained value, tangible and intangible, from the exchange. It just took a little bit of bartering to do it. It is small, which is why it is so pure and also very competitive. Um, and, and I, I, I'm thank you, thank you for, uh, by the way, playing along. I, I hope I didn't make you feel put on the spot. Uh, it, you know, I, I this, this is. Only an example as an artist who does take commissions. And over time, well, it may not be practical for me to carry a hundred pine cones at a time. So, instead, Small says, tell you what, there's this stuff called gold. And... I don't have a lot of it, and you don't have a lot of it. So what we'll do, if you're willing to accept gold for pine cones, I'm willing to accept gold for drawings. And it is a lot easier to uh, to carry a, a piece of gold than it is a hundred pine cones or uh, a fragile uh, piece of charcoal with some processed vellum that could rip or smudge or whatever else. So now we both agreed that this random metal that's kind of uh, scarce to both of us has value. Now it's all make-believe. It's pretend. We're just saying like, we're not going to melt the gold. We're not going to eat the gold. Uh, if anything, it actually weighs in our pocket. And it makes other people want to come after us for the gold. But we understand that if we have something that there's not a lot of, but we're willing to trade that instead, I don't need to drive, uh, you know, uh, six cattle over the mountain in order to exchange for uh, now not just a charcoal drawing because small has uh, continued to exist by uh, heating his cave with pine cones and eating the pine nuts, that's allowed him to do stuff like practice sculpting or other things. And now all of a sudden, and he says, I am willing to sculpt for you, but I need six cattle and not a hundred pine cones. Aw, oh, Tony, thank you. And so now, uh, you know, we're escalating, right? Our technology is improving, the things that we value as a culture, and and there's a point, too, where uh, there might be impracticalities. 
there might be some physical bartering, just like we said with uh, the Magic Card example in the friendly local game store. Tell you what, 10 bucks in a soda, and that card is yours instead of $20. Well, Tony, thank you very much. I sincerely appreciate it. And, uh, of course, uh, that sort of stuff gets turned around every month when I give away boxes of pre-painted minis uh, to people in attendance during that, those special nights. Uh, so I, I will thank you, and I will always work to earn that sentiment. But ultimately, Tony, you and everyone else are helping to put miniatures on other people's tables uh, to inspire them and to help them get into the hobby or be creative. <laughs> And so we find that there's there's a lot of this exchange going on and that it's keeping the small tribe and the the hero tribe in peace because otherwise maybe we wouldn't be peaceful. We both we both live on different sides of the mountain. We might both revere or venerate the mountain. And yet our views are such that one of us one of us wants to live in the mountain. We said Small lives in a cave, right? So Small and his people live in the mountain, which means they eat, uh, which means they they do what is necessary to live on the mountain, right? However, we might live, you know, in sight of the mountain, and we, we say, wait a minute, you... You actually live in the mountain? Like, oh, gross, like a, a maggot lives in a dead thing? Or you actually, you you sleep? You know, instead of singing praises to the mountain, you snore inside of it? You actually perpetuate the species on our holy mountain? How dare you? This is unforgivable. And despite those differences, though, the small tribe does things that ours doesn't. And so it may not come to slings and arrows. It may not come to bullets or lasers or anything else in fantasy or sci-fi or our modern times. Because as long as the small tribe keeps making drawings and doing the things that we can't or won't, and we do the same things that uh, the small tribe can't or won't, maybe it's a stature thing. I'm a tall guy, and if we're dealing with, with small guys, that, that could add to the perceived value. And then the Fire Nation attacked. <laughs> uh, be, oh, geez, that the gods must be crazy. I would highly recommend to you all. If you want a movie about economics, that's not a le uh, it's a lesson in economics, but it's not about economics, watch The Gods Must Be Crazy. That is a... 10 out of 10, Chef's Kiss would recommend every single time. If you want to get a, a, a very interesting lesson in economics without it actually being a lesson in economics. Now, hopefully, we as real people don't find ourselves in positions of, of needing to uh, have dire exchanges. Though, of course... What happens in real life? You know, people steal. People get mugged. In fantasy terms, it's someone coming up and going, you know, your GP or your HP. You choose. And at what point, then, is it more valuable to live for your, uh, for your resources, for your metal, for your money, or even your ideals, your intangibles? Is it more valuable to give that up uh, or is it more valuable to keep them? And these are decisions we all weigh in different ways. Even two people who share the same religion, maybe even come from this, uh, they're born in the same city. They would react in two different ways to that same threat from a bandit or a, a would-be mugger in real life. And for their own reasons, with their own abilities and resources. Some people will never bend the knee. It's a source of pride. Whether it's it's being indignant or it's just a matter of, of honor. I, I would rather die and not give up my religion to yours. 
uh, than to worship something that I, I don't, I don't and can't believe in. Even if it was just as easy as uh, you have to, you have to wear a special necklace. That's it. That's all the, the, the person's asking you to do. That's the line, though. Uh, now, we simulate this in many different ways. Of course, we, we live in different economics. We value different things. Different political or economic systems do the same thing. Because those systems were built on the smaller aspects of the individual. And this is a very good board game I would highly recommend. If, if there's any of you out there that uh, haven't played Settlers of Catan, what are you doing? <laughs> Who are you? Why? <laughs> Who are you? Settlers of Catan is an, ex is an excellent example of, uh, of economics. Although it's all through bartering. Right? As we're developing this island. Now, I bring this up. I'm going to highlight right here. Okay? Well, other currencies have been used. And in fact, that the first currency was Electrum. The mix of gold and silver. Why is it, especially when it comes to fantasy, and of course, our our real currency, why is gold a commonly accepted uh, source of value? And chat, this is open to you. There's not one answer to this. There's many. So don't feel, if you're like, well, I have an idea. Could that be the correct one? I want you to throw out why why is gold a commonly accepted uh, a commonly accepted resource for trade? Rarity, malleable, beautiful. Okay, it is shiny, and we we do like shiny things. So you're correct. It is scarce. And while it's heavy, it can be turned into a great many things, right? We can turn it into coins or bars. We can turn it into uh, idols, false or otherwise. Uh, we can use it for the sake of art. Uh, have, uh, oh, shoot, what's the name of it? The Japanese art of uh, fixing like a broken vase with gold to show that there's beauty in flaws. Or that to show that there's still a glimmer to things that are imperfect. It's kin, uh, kin something. It kinsuki? Is it kinsuki? Oh, kinsuki. Okay. Uh, a roll twenty. Yeah, sure. One moment. Yep, all right, so there are some practical, right? In electronics, it actually has a practical use. It has artistic use, uh, and it also is scarce. Now, here's something else. While we do use silver or even copper, uh, and they have different levels of uh, scarcity, and they have different levels of shine, why is gold... Why is gold often the superior currency. Why is gold worth more than even silver or copper? And scarcity can play into it, but there's something else that we haven't brought up yet. Especially if we invented the elf. Here's a clue. If we invented an alphabet, if we invented numbers in order to work and tell stories and write things down to pass on, wouldn't we also want our labor, our work, preserved in some way? Not just through letters or not just through math. How can we preserve the works of us, let alone our ancestors, and the labor they spent and the things that they've done? Ah, Sierra? 
and Tony. Got it. Gold might be lost to the sea. Might be thrown into a volcano, which is, well, I mean, that's a rare circumstance. A necessary one, but a rare one. But gold won't tarnish. It won't rust. It won't degrade by simply sitting around. In statue form or otherwise. And so it preserves. Once it's discovered, once it's mined, it is preserved moving forward. And so we can preserve the wealth, the labor, the stories, the religions, everything that is made and done with now this symbol of drawings and pine cones. Now, I've brought this up before, but uh, there's another metal that would work pretty well. Might, in some ways, arguably be better than gold. However, in fantasy times, as much as we might consider those to whenever that would be, it was not abundant nor practical. No, oh, platinum, palladium, okay. There are some things that, that take some extra processing too, like titanium. Like, oh, what's this weird crystal? That's titanium. But you didn't know it. Aluminum. Aluminum. What won't tarnish? What is malleable? And at the time, would have been very scarce because of how it had to be refined or extracted. Black unterstrich Kevin said you get 40% credit. So not how two tower capsule for folks, but this can go to a giveaway pool. Alright, Bane, we will start tomorrow's broadcast from the store with 40 of the necessary $50 to start a giveaway. And of course the giveaway has free shipping to a US address and everything. So thank you very much, Bane, for throwing in towards that. Yeah, so we're aware of platinum, we're aware of aluminum, but we couldn't process it. It, it might have been something very, very rare. But gold was easier to extract, though scarce, and it also preserved itself. Although, I, I here's, a, uh, here's a chemistry question, or I guess an alchemical question, if we want to explore the realm of... If we want to explore the realm of... Uh, of uh, fantasy, what could actually destroy gold? And of course, we have alchemy being, oh, let's turn lead, a very common, also easy to extract, malleable metal. How can we turn something abundant into something scarce? Alchemy led to gold. What actually destroy? Well, I, all right, I, I mean an actual chemical reaction, not just a, a sociological condition. <laughs> Bane. I appreciate it. That's a good moral lesson. It's another element. Yeah, there we go. Goblin of Gygaxanor. Mercury. Do you know what else destroys aluminum, by the way? Yeah, mercury. By the way, have fun with that. If you want to cause some interesting chaos... Uh, have a, uh, have someone, uh, break into the royal treasury and spray mercury everywhere. Now, how can you extract mercury? Eh, look into it. We have cinnabar and some other things. What destroys aluminum? Government regulation, says Bane. The recycling system, says Tio. Uh, which I understand, actually, the, the state of California is having a bit of a, a snafu regarding uh, recycling aluminum right now. But that's a uh, that, that that's an IRL topic that maybe we'll we'll keep out of. It's economic for sure. Don't get me wrong. And we can get into how it intersects with uh, 
with uh, uh, tensions of uh, between various groups of people. But, um, yep, watch YouTube videos on mercury and aluminum. Yeah. So just how the Joker destroyed uh, money by setting it on fire? Uh, break into the king's treasury sometime with, and uh, somehow magically or alchemically produce mercury and see what happens. <laughs> uh, that is a TLDR of that for sure, Bane. Absolutely. Um... It used to be. That's why the top of the Washington Monument was made out of it, because it was a flex on people. Like, ah, oh, we can afford an aluminum top to the Washington Monument. So, I, I urge you with these concepts, go into your favorite game. It might be D&D. &D. If you want, go into Alien RPG, even. And take a look at, at what exists. Let's go to... Uh, here we go. We're we're in the equipment section here. If you want a uh if you want a Siegson C series magnetic tape recorder, that costs 50 to a hundred dollars. And you can record and play music on it. Oh, isn't that interesting? Now maybe you go to the planet in Alien RPG where these are produced. It might be the 50 side of 50 to 100, or you might even be able to buy it for 40 because you're buying straight from the source. They are abundant. They're not scarce. Even though they're new, fresh off the line. But be open to this, right? There are suggestions in rule books for fantasy. You know, if, if you say, wait a minute, a Pauling med pod is two million dollar dues. Well, go someplace to uh, I get a used one. Or go someplace where they're more abundant. Or some, or get one with less features. Or make more money. There's a lot of different ways that any of these could be addressed. And they have different tensions, by the way, uh, with every each of the solutions. However, if you're telling the story, you know, make, make those quick decisions. Is this place actually just rife with pine cones? Pine cones probably don't have a high value. If you are a druid that can produce a pine cone and you go to a land where pine cones don't exist, that pine cone, which is ubiquitous where you live, might as well be a deific uh, thing of worship. It, pro it provides warmth. It provides food. It provides life. And not only that, the type of life that comes from a pine cone, you're telling me a shrimp fried this rice. I, I mean, I'm sorry. You're telling me this evergreen tree doesn't lose its leaves in the autumn? It doesn't even lose the leaves in the winter? Come on. Well, you might then say, no, you don't believe me, huh? plant it. Tra I'll, I'll come back and trade. You'd be the only one in your realm with a pine cone that you could probably get, I'd say of all the seeds here, maybe at least 10 of them would take if you tend to them, like I'll teach you. Aha. Uh -huh. Well then. And all of a sudden to that culture, the exclusivity and the multi-purposedness of the pine cone makes it valuable while a pine cone's all but worthless back in your land. And suddenly we have noodles from China becoming a staple in Italy for food. Where maybe even in a common cultural acceptance, we say, oh, of course, pasta is from Italy. Now, pasta might be Italian, yes. Did it originate there? Mm. Who is that guy we talked about a little bit before? Sir? 
So... Would that I knew, Goblin, uh, in, in that circumstance. Uh, but take take those decisions. If you go, wait a minute, plate mail is 1,500 gold pieces. Well, maybe in this time, in your fantasy world, plate mail, maybe because metal is so abundant, that plate mail is actually just 10 gold pieces. Everyone and their mom has plate mail. Who does it? You don't have plate mail? Oh, jeez. Wah, wah, come on. What are you doing? And that's fine. The suggestions in here are suggestions. Uh, could they be tied to some real world application? Maybe. In fact, if you look at the absolute core of why things have a, uh, a value, it's because we're trying to find a way to preserve our lives the time and the labor of our lives. By the way, in Dragonlance, they actually use steel pieces as currency because steel is extremely useful and, uh, and it carries value. Because if you get 1,500 steel pieces together, you might actually have a suit of armor. But if we come down here to... in the Player's Handbook, anyway, of D&D 5th Edition... This is the core for any any place that you present, okay? Trade goods is getting close. We could uh, we could take a summary of that with the life the lifestyle expenses because that is a more immediate uh, manifestation of how much our life is worth, quote unquote, which by the way, last night, that's why I say I don't like come back to, to life spells. Because, in my opinion, it cheapens life. Um, and I, I would not want that to happen. And also why I don't allow bags of holding, because those things can destroy economy, or just kind of... It takes away the potency of the, the discoveries. You know, what is actually valuable uh, to you all as a party. Food, drink, and lodging. Again, things that are very close to people, but take a look at the people. All right, an untrained, uh, an untrained hireling. All right, generic, untrained labor. We're talking farmers. We're talking uh, porters. Uh, we're talking maybe even couriers. Uh, we might even be talking a lot of basic guard duty. This is two silver pieces per day. So, you work five days, congrats, you made one gold piece. You want that suit of shiny armor? That's going to be a lot more scarce, because if we go with by-the-book evaluations, you're going to have to work a couple extra days. <laughs> Can you come in on Saturday? <sighs> yeah, that'd be nice. Now, skilled labor, aha! We're talking the professors, the, the, the priests, we're talking... Uh, we're, uh, we're talking, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, the soldier that has been trained and, and has survived, right? The veterans or the, the people who've been guarding caravans for more than a couple years. They, in this presentation of an economic force, are two gold pieces per day. A farmer would have to work ten days to the skilled labor working one day. Oh. And maybe that puts perspective on things. So when you're creating your world, imagine that. Well, how scarce are the materials or the labor if there's not a lot of people because maybe they all died out because of a plague like the, uh, like the Black Death. All of a sudden, you are going to find that your wages are going up because there's not as many people working. There's a scarcity of labor, and its its perceived value increases. And and this is going to get... I'm not going to take us there, but in with Investopedia, you can look up uh, supply and demand graphs. Okay? They, they slide, they do a bunch of this and that, supply and demand. I'd also look up 
a concept called elasticity. Elasticity. If you understand the general forces of supply and demand, which can apply to labor, let alone um, uh, water, uh, knives, uh, I guess that's more of a box opener, but you, you're going to get a tremendous amount of power to customize and influence the, uh, your world and make a very believable economy because of what things are valued, uh, because of the availability or the preciousness of it or how durable it is, how elastic or inelastic it is. Because there's some things people will pay any price for, which is why you can charge a lot of money and see almost no drop in demand. Because people will pay... I could sell melatonin for $2, but in a world that needs sleep... And, and the same amount of people need it, I could charge $20 for a bottle of melatonin and almost no one would stop buying melatonin from me. That's an example of elasticity or something being inelastic. Uh, do I have my TPS report? Uh... 208 per day, wouldn't that be nice as small? <laughs> Bane shouts, I'm a silver heir, y'all! <laughs> James says, I have a good aligned wizard that is using magic items to become a lich. Instead of killing people, he is draining magic items that basically hold the life force of the time spent in crafting them. Ah, yes. What's the going rate for CEOs and gold? Asks Sierra Echo. Uh, I think that would actually have a listed price in Shadowrun, uh, since their CEOs are dragons. And uh, <laughs> Bane says, uh, honestly, souls are cheap. Uh, just offer ice cream. The stupid mortals aren't smart enough to know what they are giving away. Have you seen what people are willing to give up for the capsules I've sponsored? Uh, asks Bane. Is this the arch-villain universe that makes uh, Senpai Jeff Bezos? No, it's uh, th I, th these are natural forces to which we're exposed. And if you don't have an understanding of it, uh, you know, it's it can sour people's opinions or have them think violent or radical things uh, without the understanding of how these forces operate. Just as it can be like blaming an angry god that a storm has rolled in. What did you do to, to get this storm to roll? Like, we had to go today. We can also be just as irrational at other forces we don't understand. Or we seek to replace the... We seek to replace the bad gods with better gods. Gods that will serve us better. Or at least we hope or think. And it's, it's just a, a way to reflect and to try and get the basics of what might actually be happening. You know, who is the man behind the curtain? Um, as well as to be considerate, because as we say in Dungeons and & Dragons and other RPGs, there are consequences such that greedy dragons get hunted down for their gold stashes. Uh, in our real world, there's a, a very uh, prolific phrase, which is pigs are fed, hogs are slaughtered. If you're just an average pig, of course, there in English, there's connotations uh, to that as well. If you're just an average pig, you're doing your thing. You get fed slop. Uh, you roll around in it. You get to, you know, you, you have a, a litter of uh, little piglets and, you know, you're doing your thing out on the farm. But hogs... And I'm not talking about the meme of cranking hogs. Hogs, oh, that's the juicy stuff. They're fat. They've overeaten. They've indulged. And really, what are they providing the farm? If they're not, they're not making more pigs. Uh, they're taking up a lot of space and a lot of resources. And they're also really tasty. 
And we see that with uh, individual uh, greed. We see that with uh, the the pursuit. Uh, however, you want to uh, attach greed to the concept. There's there's many levels or even words for it. But take a look at the the consequences for other actions. Have you seen? Have you seen the price of Disney stock? Disney was a golden. Oh man, you hold on to that. It paid dividends. Disney could do no wrong. Man, hit after hit. Who doesn't like Disney? Have you seen them? What brought that about? Conflict? Being hoggish in something? Not having, not maintaining a perceived value? Because again, at the end of the day... Here's what I got in my wallet, everyone. Uh, I am... That's right. I have two dollar dues. This is how rich I am, okay? I have two dollars on me right now. Do you know what this is? This is pretend. This is makeup. I pretend this is worth something, and you pretend that it is too, and we, we trade it back and forth. But as soon as we no longer perceive the value, or we don't want to play that game anymore... So, what I mean to say by this, everyone, you are a living part of an economic engine by existing. Your time, your labor, your skills are worth different amounts to different people depending on how you wish to apply it. Or don't. Uh, as that is an opportunity cost. As you're choosing to do one thing instead of the other. And so there, there is the... Do you take more uh, physical or intangible gain than you would otherwise? Whether it's rational or, or uh, irrational? Do you choose to manipulate people through FOMO or YOLO? Or through unethical behavior? And if so, are there consequences to, uh, to pay for it? Even if not in the immediacy, it could in the long term. What happened to Enron? What happened to any company that went, you know, that, that had this Icarus, right? Too high, too close to the sun, too ambitious, overextended, over, got over leveraged with debt. Too much, too fast. Culture couldn't adapt. Belief systems couldn't adapt. Because I have to believe in this actually being something for it to be something. And if I can't believe that is worth anything, I don't have the time, the effort, or the ability to do so, then this is worth the, the cotton it's printed on. Because I could, I could burn this for, you know, a couple seconds of some, of some warmth. Because at the end of the day, that or, you know, non-toxic doesn't necessarily mean edible, but any port in a storm, I guess. <laughs> Chickens and pottery will always be worth something. Goblin of Gygaxenor? It, it, there's Because there's so much practical use to it. Absolutely. You homebrewed a vampire? Oh, well, do tell us all about it then, Asa. Uh, it is Asa Mitaka, correct? Or is it uh, Asami Taka? Uh, sorry if I if I don't know the the syllable break. So anyway, play more Catan, and you know, poke around, look back into our real history, read about concepts like this on Investopedia. Even if there are aspects to the economy or the economic system we use that you loathe and that uh, and that you seek a radical change in how this operates, 
I, I don't know in what way. If you understand the system, you can operate through it, against it, or to guide it elsewhere over time. And you can learn how to communicate and trade ideas and such with other people, such that your way forward might actually become the popular believable way. This is the way. Do you all... Do, Oh, shoot. Where's our Beskar? You want to talk about a valuable resource in the Star Wars universe? Uh, Beskar is... Uh, that That's it, right? Asa. Okay. Asa Mitaka. Okay. And if I, if I mispronounce it or if I get the syllables uh, incorrect, let me know and I'll be happy to uh, go back and, uh, and fix it. So... As we all seek, we all seek this magic blue triangle right here at the top. 